Greetings in the wonderful name of Jesus. Well, it's Wednesday in the word time. It's time for us to fellowship in the word of God. And I want to thank you for gathering around the table of truth. I know God has blessed your day and I know the Holy Spirit has been leading and guiding you in all truth. And we're getting ready to magnify truth now. We are going through the scriptures. I often say this. I love going down the scripture because the Bible is a book that God has given us. And it's a current event every time you open it. Every time you read the word of God, it is relevant. It's for the time. It never goes out of season. It is a fresh word from God. Well, let's pray and go right into our lesson. Father, we thank you for the power of your word and the authority of Jesus Christ in his name in the earth. We thank you, Father, that you've given us knowledge, wisdom, and understanding that you may magnify your truth in this world. I ask now that you will speak through us, speak through me, God. Uh, thank through the arena of my mind. Help me process information, revelation, Lord God, in harmony with your will in the name of Jesus. I thank you now for the hearts of your people that are ready to receive the word of God, not as from a man, but as from God himself. Let their faith be nourished up in truth today, Father, that we may walk in the light of your countenance, giving glory to your name. It's in Jesus' Jesus name I pray. Amen. Well, take your word, your sword of the spirit, the word of God, and turn to Second Peter. If you're not there, we're going into chapter two today. Peter is going to put the magnifying glass of truth on these false teachers that we have made reference to uh, throughout these teachings of first and second Peter. But in second Peter chapter two, he specifically targets these false teachers. Listen, listen. We're going to have false teachers and false teaching as long as Satan is allowed the ability to roam in the earth. So we may well get ready for it and get ready to know that God has provided light and uh, we are called to represent him with the truth of his word. And now in chapter 2, verse 1 through 3, I call this doctrines of devils. Uh, with all the modern technology we have, all these means of communication we have today, Satan uses these avenues as means to communicate false doctrine, false teaching that's being spread out throughout the world. And this false teaching is a representation of his very nature. Because Satan's Satan very nature is a nature of lies, is a nature of evil, it is a nature of destruction. Jesus even called him the father of lies. All lies originate from Satan. So what he does, he has these evil spirits, these unclean spirits, and they influence people in order to get them to become Satan's representatives in communicating false teachings or false doctrines. And uh, this information goes out. But thank God that he's given us insight in the scriptures how we are to respond to this false teaching. The first thing we need to know that according to uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, he said, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you. Now notice this, old people said it like this, there's nothing new under the sun. I believe they got that from the Bible. Because Ecclesiastes, Solomon, when he went out and began to test the waters of the world, in Ecclesiastes 1.9, this is what he said. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. And so Peter says that these false teachers, they were present during the Old Testament time. And you know, when I looked at that, I thought about cases in the Bible that you may be familiar with, because we see false prophets and false teaching under the Old Testament. And one of them that stood out was in 1 King uh, 18, uh, verse 19 through 40. Remember Elijah? Uh, when uh, Ahad, who was king, and Jezebel, who was queen, they had these false prophets. We call them the prophets of Baal. They prophesied lies. They led God's people into idolatry. One thing about false teaching is they lead people into false worship. Jesus said the true worshiper is going to worship the Father in spirit and truth. But Satan hates that kind of worship. So what he does, he's going to send that false teaching to lure people from true worship. And they'll begin to worship idols. They'll get in to worship self. They worship the creature more than the creator, and we're going to talk about that later. But also in Jeremiah 28, there was a false prophet 
by the name of Hania. Now what Hania did, if you read Jeremiah 28, he claimed that God was going to deliver his people from exile, from Babylon, within two years. That was not what the Spirit of God said. The Spirit of God had spoken to Jeremiah and said that it would be a 70-year period before their deliverance came. So what was the false prophet doing? He was giving them false hope. It's called deception. And false teaching does that. It gives people false hope through lies. Another case is in Jeremiah uh, 29, verse 24 through 32. Uh, there was a prophet, these prophets, Shimei and Nechalite. These individuals were individuals who, again, they opposed the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a true prophet from God. But they sent letters to the priests in Jerusalem discrediting the prophecy of Jeremiah concerning the, exile, the, the exiles in Babylon. Here again, we got what? We got true prophets. We got false prophets. And then in Ezekiel, Ezekiel during his time in Ezekiel 13, what did the false prophets do? They watered down the truth. Isn't that present today? One translation said they whitewashed the truth. In other words, they offered the people peace in the time of destruction. Here again, deception. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 15. He said, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, <clears throat> but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. It's very important that Christians be wise today because sometimes we are so deceived because these false prophets, they look for platforms, and as I said, the technology now, they're all out there in various ways, giving false teaching through social media, but one of the platforms that have always been something attractive to false teachers is what we call church, church settings. Why? They know that individuals there are in a position where they could be more vulnerable to false teaching, especially when they disguise it in the package of religion. And so I want to take a moment and kind of give some characteristics that I see that was among the false prophets during biblical times, Old and New Testament. And because remember, Satan is ultimately behind these false teachers. It's doctrines of devils. It's not the doctrine of God. It's not the doctrine of Jesus Christ. It's the doctrines of devils. These are some characteristics that I saw in scripture with individuals who operated in this spirit of false doctrine. First of all, they lie. Why? Because their father is a liar. Satan is the father of lies. Another one is they deceive people. They make people think something is true when it's not true. They manipulate through mental strategies. They have a way of getting into the mind of people. Uh, that's why the Bible tells us not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal. We got to get our mind renewed with the word of God. We got to have the word of God in our thought life. Another thing they do, they promote idolatry and self-worship. You know, these false teachers, they direct people away from true worship, the worship of God, the worship of Jesus Christ, and uh, they lead people into looking unto them or looking unto themselves, making themselves like they are God to be worshipped, creating their own truth, creating their own righteousness, creating their own concept of who God is. Well, God has revealed himself in Scripture. If we get in the word of God, we can know God and we can be known of God if we're his children. Another one is they oppose truth and true prophets. You know, these individuals, they speak against the truth and they speak against those who may be preaching truth or proclaiming truth. That's part of the deception to draw people after themselves. And they seek fame. They seek popularity. They want to be well known. Another thing is they exploit others for personal gain. That's one of the motivations they have is greed and covetousness. They're getting something from people for their personal gain, and it's usually in the form of money. I just wanted to bring out some characteristics of false prophets that we see in the Bible. Now, Peter, he goes to the Old Testament prophets, but notice, he exposes the New Testament false teachers. You get that? Old Testament prophets, but he's dealing with New Testament false teachers. 
Now, you notice that when it came to Old Testament false prophets, they prophesied in Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Elijah, and different ones. They prophesied. They prophesied uh, to the nation. You know, they prophesied to the king. They prophesied concerning world events. And uh, But false teachers are a little different. They get much closer. They don't speak from afar. They're usually right there sitting among you. They're usually right there in your setting. And so Peter, he uses the Old Testament to expose the New Testament false teaching, but they're all functioning at, by the same spirit. Doctrines of devils, Satan's spirit. Now, this is where the saints become vulnerable. They show up in church settings. Yes. Paul in 2 Corinthians 11, listen to what he said in uh, verse number, I think it's 2 Corinthians verse 11, chapter 11, verse 13 to 15. Listen to what he said. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing and if, if his ministers, his angels, his spirits, those who he's influencing, also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Satan uses fallen angels, and he uses vessels that are empty. Yes, he uses these vessels that are empty. They are they are not filled with the knowledge of God's word. They are filled with false doctrine. Now he goes on to say that there will be false teachers among who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. Now I want you to really look at that word, destructive heresies, because this is what is considered a sect. In other words, it's a spirit that calls people to select parties within the church which causes division. This spirit seeks to get others to make choices between the doctrine of Jesus, the doctrine that magnifies the truth of the gospel for other forms of doctrines. Because the scripture says, uh, there will be false teachers among who will secretly bring in destructive heresies even, now notice, denying the Lord who brought them and bring on themselves with destruction. Now, when he say denying the Lord who brought them, I want to give some understanding because he's not saying the Lord who saved them. These false teachers, they are not born again believers because in Jude, uh, uh, one, uh, Jude 19, the Bible says, these are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. They don't have the Holy Spirit, so they can't be children of God. They can't be people who are born again. These people don't belong to the family of God, even though Satan plants them among the believers. He plants them among the believers. Now, Romans 8 and 9 confirms this because the Bible says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, now if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not here. So these, these false teachers, they do not have the spirit of Christ. So these are not born again believers. These are false teachers who have deceived, who Satan is using to bring false doctrine. They're denying the, the teachings of Jesus. You say, well, well how, how, how are they denying Jesus? His doctrines. They're denying justification by faith alone. They're denying the need for repentance from sin. They're denying the eternal judgment that God has for those who do not repent and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. They're denying the righteousness of God. They're denying uh, 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 Jesus Christ being the only way. I've heard people get up, even preach and make a statement. Well, it, it, it doesn't matter how you get to God. It does matter. Acts 4 and 12 says, there's no other name given among men whereby we can be saved but the name of Jesus Christ. In John 14 and 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And see, when you're teaching the doctrines of Jesus, you have to be crystal clear. You do not water it down for the culture. You do not change it to accommodate people. And if you do, it's because you're looking for the acceptance of the world. You're looking for the fame. 
You're looking for the fame. We got to communicate truth in our teaching, in our preaching. We have to communicate truth in our songs of worship. Some of the worship songs are not based on the truth of the word of God, but they'll sing them in churches. You can't worship God unless we worship, worship him based on the truth of his word. So not only was their message false, but their method uh, is false as well. Notice he said they are among you. That means they have taken a seat within the church fellowship. And get this now, they catch members. They catch followers. Because the Bible says in verse 2, and many will follow their destructive ways. Who are they catching? They are catching the unlearned and the unstable. That's who they are catching. People who won't take time to humble themselves and desire the sincere milk of the word that they can grow thereby. People who won't take time to stay under the word of God. They lure off. They, they go after strange fire. They're seeking their own way. They're filled with pride. He's going to bring out some specific examples that Satan used individuals to deceive them. And so in verse number two, they catch those who are unlearned and unstable. And notice this now, the Bible says, many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. They are not going to magnify the gospel of Jesus. They are not going to magnify God's word concerning the doctrines of the deity of Christ, the absolute truth of Jesus, uh, the blood of Christ, that we can only be justified by faith through Christ. His blood that has been shed for our sins. They're going to they're gonna try to mix it with some other things and therefore it becomes error. And uh, they also will misinterpret the scriptures. All of this come with false teaching. Now notice in verse 3 he said by covetousness. Now notice they will exploit you with deceptive words. That's interesting because notice they're going to use words. They're going to twist words. They're going to mis misinterpret words. They're going to use words to get into people's minds and deceive people and lure them away from the truth. He said, for a long time, their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. In other words, God knows exactly how to deal with them and God is going to deal with them. Now, you notice in verse number four, through nine, I call this the proof is in the pudding. Because Peter now uses three examples to verify the truth of his insight and instructions as it relates to these false teachers and those who are following their deceptive teaching and magnifying uh, that spirit of false doctrine. And you know, their false teaching was sensual in nature. It wasn't sacred. It wasn't creating an environment where people are going to become spiritually equipped to do the work of the ministry, where people are going to be spiritually empowered to destroy the works of the devil, where they're going to be equipped so that they can uh, 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 wrestle not with flesh and blood. Hallelujah. They'll understand this battle is a spiritual battle. And they're not going to be equipped like that. They're going to lure them through sensuality, pleasure, things that make them feel good. Things that give them the ability to live any kind of lifestyle and yet claim an allegiance to God. That's part of false teaching. False teaching don't challenge, challenge us relative to our conduct or behavior. In other words, they matter of fact motivate uh, ungodly behavior. And, uh, and, and so that's part of the, the strategy of the false teaching. And so now Peter comes and, and he provides encouragement. And, and, and sometimes we start talking about Examples used from Old Testament that these examples are written for our warning and our, our admonition according to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. God put this stuff here so we can learn from their mistakes, but also to encourage us. So I say in verses 4 through 9, we have uh, 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 the combination of encouragement and warning and counsel. So the first witness Peter brings on the, on, before us for if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. 
You know, these are the fallen angels. And most of us who study the Bible, we believe that in Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, which describes Lucifer, the highest of the angelic order, he was dethroned, dethroned because of pride, wanting to exalt himself above the most high. And in Revelation 12, 4 suggests at least one third of the angels fell with Lucifer who became Satan, which is basically the adversary of God. And so he uses these false angels as a witness to encourage believers that God knows what he's doing now. God knows how to deal with the devil. Hallelujah. God knows how to deal with the false teachers in their false doctrine. And God is going to hold them accountable. And as with these false angels, the Bible say to be reserved for judgment. Satan and all of his angels are reserved for judgment. And even so is with these false teachers. So that should encourage Christians who are staying with the truth. Who are knowing that, you know, we, we have to deal with the fact that we're going to have false teachers and false doctrine. And here we are motivated to share the gospel of Jesus, to magnify the truth. And then you got all of this uh, false teaching and luring people even out of the local church. And they're following these individuals who create division in the church and going off like they got some deep revelation and drawing people after themselves, these wolves that are coming in sheep clothing and coming into churches and getting, you know, involved and moving up into leadership just to lure off sheep. It's happening today. It was happening then and it's happening today. Another uh, uh, a witness that Peter brings in verse 5, and did not and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. Now, I call this the witness of Noah. And uh, we see this in Genesis chapter 6. But remember now, Noah was just not, you know, living morally right and all of this. But Noah was a preacher of righteousness in the midst of all of that violence and sin and disregard for God going on in that world. There was still some righteous preaching happening. Hallelujah. That's encouragement. That's encouragement to you and I. We're going to keep upholding the bloodstained banner. We're going to keep preaching the gospel of Jesus. We're going to keep exalting the doctrines of Jesus Christ. Regardless of what's going out there on social media, regardless of all of this false teaching and false doctrine that's going on, we're going to continue to magnify the truth of the gospel of Jesus. And so he, that's encouragement. All of the world was going toward evil, violence, destruction, selfishness, pride. But thank God Noah and his family, God spared them because Noah was found righteous. He was a righteous preacher. He was preaching righteousness. And let us keep preaching righteousness. Let us keep proclaiming the truth. And then he goes on. Let's look at this third witness. In verse 6, in turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by searing sin and hearing their lawless deeds. The third witness is Sodom and Gomorrah. We see that in Genesis chapter 18 and 19. And in and, and Genesis 13, 13, the Bible gives us some insight here. The scripture said, but the men of Sodom were wicked, sinning greatly against the Lord. God had an issue with Sodom and Gomorrah. God is the one that brought judgment because of their sin. And then the scripture tells us in Jude 1, 7, making reference to Sodom and Gomorrah again, says this. And don't forget the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring towns, all full of lust of every kind, including lust of men for other men. Those cities were destroyed by fire and continue to be a warning to us that there is a hell in which sinners are punished. You know, that's the preaching we got to proclaim. We got to tell people the truth. Because when we look at the days of Noah and we look at the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, that's the picture of our present world today that we're living in. Now, that's the truth. 
And those of us who are willing to sp uh, 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 speak truth, we see that is the condition of our present world today. And the men of Solomon, uh, they practice filthy behavior in unlawful deeds. Now, when it says unlawful deeds, remember now, the law had not yet been given. So we're not talking about laws that are legislated by man and people don't want to, you know, commit to those laws. We're talking about the law of God's righteousness being established through the very nature that he created humans in. That's a law. It's called, we can call it the law of nature. And so in Romans chapter 1, I want to read this because Paul specifically identifies what this looked like. In Romans chapter 1, verse 24 and 25, the Bible says, Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Notice this. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. Where that came from? False teaching? False doctrine? watered down doctrine we have to let god be god and let god be true in every man a liar that's the way we approach the word of god and the bible say they what they did they they magnify self-worship they worship the creature more than the creator that's self-worship that's idolatry and then romans 1 26 and 27 listen what the bible say that is why god abandoned them to their shameful desires even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulge in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relationships with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of this sin, notice, as a result of this sin, what's that sin? Sin of homosexuality. As a result of this sin, they suffer within themselves the penalty they deserve. Now, what am I preaching? What am I sharing? I'm not sharing my opinion. I'm not sharing my perspective. I'm only reading God's word. See, when we are, we are true teachers of the word of God, we just speak truth. We teach what God said. We rightly divide the word of truth. We don't try to say, okay, this is true, but uh, I think it, uh, uh, Paul meant this. Uh, I think, if, like I heard one preacher say, if Paul was preaching in this day and time, he literally reinterpreted the scriptures as if though Paul would modernize the message to change the message. No, we bring the same truth into present day culture. And we just let God be the judge. And we have to tell people the truth concerning what God has said. Now, each of us will have to give an account for ourselves in the day of judgment. And I don't know about you, but to me, this is good news that Peter's bringing to Christians. In the midst of the false teaching, he said that God dealt with the angels who uh, turned away from truth. And he, get this now, he kicked them out of heaven. God dealt with the people of Noah's day. God dealt with Sodom and Gomorrah, but look at Abraham, what he was. He wasn't doing what they were doing in Sodom and Gomorrah. What was he doing? Praying, interceding. That's what he was doing. We're doing that today. We're interceding for our world. We're interceding for the condition of our world. We're praying. But we're not going to change the truth. We're not going to stop preaching the, the word of God. We're not going to avoid certain scriptures that speak plainly concerning certain sins and behavior and practices. Whether it's approved by man, whether it's approved by the government, that doesn't matter. We have to say what God has said on the matter. And so this is good news. For those of us who are born again, for those of us who want to walk in the light of truth, for those of us who want to follow the doctrines, the teachings of Jesus, and the teachings of the Apostle Paul, which is the gospel of Christ. It is good news to us. It's good news to know that what's going on in our world today, God is well aware of it. Just as he was well aware of what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. But yet Abraham, 
They're interceding in Lot. You know, Lot had some, 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 some issues going on, but because I believe he was righteous, he, had, uh, he was uh, with uh, Abraham walking in that grace uh, uh, that God had placed on Abraham, and, and, and Lot got a lot of mercy. But God brought him out. That says something right there, that he was different. God brought him out. His wife wanted to go back. She didn't want to disconnect. But thank God he brought him out. And thank God that God brings us out of judgment that may even come upon this world. I don't believe the righteous is going to be here. I think the rapture is going to come before that great day. Hallelujah. I believe God's going to call the church. And I'm not talking about building church people, religion. I'm talking about the righteous. Hallelujah. The righteous is not going to experience that wrath of God's judgment because God's going to call us. Hallelujah. Yes. And so I encourage you right now, if you're not born again, get born again. This is real. There is a day of eternal judgment. And that judgment, as in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, the Bible say it rained down fire like brimstone. Can you imagine? We know what rain is like. And we know when rain is pouring down, sometimes you can't only either just get to your car. It's coming down so heavy. It creates flood. Can you imagine fire coming down in a greater degree? Well, that's what the Bible say, that this present world is going to be destroyed by fire. And so here, yes, there's warning, but there's also encouragement for believers. Listen to what Jesus said concerning Lot, the story of Lot in Luke 17, 28 and 29 and verse 32. Jesus said, likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day that the Lot left Sodom, it rained fire and sulfur from heaven and destroyed all of them. Remember Lot's wife. Hallelujah. Jesus put that in there. Remembers Lot's wife, what she did. Her heart was still in Sodom. Thank God for those of us whose heart is not trying to live against God's word, but we're seeking to live in agreement with God's word and thank God for grace and mercy for us to do that. Hallelujah. That doesn't mean we're perfect, but man, we've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, not with silver and gold. Those are corruptible things, but we've been redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus. And it's time for people to hear the gospel concerning Jesus Christ. He's done everything to secure our eternal salvation. He's paid the price. But there's a, and, and, and matter of fact, the scripture tells us we've received the ministry of reconciliation. That God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Go tell people how they can be reconciled. God had done his part. Jesus has died for sin. He's died for sinners. But now sinners, sinners have to come to Christ and repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ so that they can be born again. And the scripture says in verse nine, then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. Isn't that good news to the righteous? One of us in Bible say, Lot vexed his soul with that condition that he was living in. Amen. He, you know, he when he went over into that area, it was because of pride. He looked at, you know, he remembered Egypt and see, you got to be careful allowing that spirit of the world to influence your decisions. And, and Lot ended up there, but thank God mercy went with him and mercy followed him and mercy brought him out. But thank God that the Lord knows how to deliver the righteous. When we look at the way of our world today, that's why I told him on Sunday. We as believers, we look through a different set of lens at the condition of our world. And uh, we have what the world don't have. We have a sure word of prophecy. We have the Holy Spirit. We have a father who said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We have a father who said, I will set up my abode in you. I've given you the first fruits of your inheritance. You've been sealed with the spirit of promise. We have the Holy Spirit, a helper, a strengthener, a comforter. Man, God has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness in Christ Jesus. And so the redeemed of the Lord, even though there's false teachers, and they're going to remain, as long as Satan remains, we're going to have false teachers. But however, their judgment is set by God. The good news is God's people who will not follow false teachers or false teaching, we will remain faithful to the truth of Scripture. They will, uh, we're going to be nourished up in the word of truth. That's why you see it now in the body of Christ, that performing preaching, you know what I mean, that emotional preaching, hooping and all that, and people just getting happy. 
You know, it's almost like they get a sugar high on Sunday and just last for a few minutes. But God wants you and I to be built up in the word of truth, well nourished, so we can identify false teachers and false teaching. And I believe it's those who can take on the meat of the word, who know how to exercise their spiritual senses to discern what is of God and what is not of God. Well, the scripture says, and I want to close with this, in 1 Timothy 4 and 6, Paul gave Timothy instructions. He said, if you point these things out to the brothers, the things that he had already given him instructions to point out concerning how they can walk with God and walk in agreement with the truth and avoid those false teachers of that day, he said, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, brought up in the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. What he's saying, you're going to be well nourished. You're going to be built up in the truth. You're going to be able to let the truth be magnified in and through your life. But that's what God has called every person, whether you are, are what Timothy was a minister, was basically a servant. That's basically what he did. He served in the local church. We call it servant leadership. It's not what we see in our world today. So I have a few faith action questions. The first one is this. How can you ensure you're on a spiritual diet of truth and remain steadfast? I believe, first of all, you have to study to show yourself approved under God, a workman, a workwoman that need not to be ashamed, rightly divine the word of truth. I pray you got, I, I believe you have to search the scriptures to make sure you understand that they are speaking in agreement. That, that means we water the word with the word. What do you mean? The Bible doesn't contradict itself. The Bible builds upon itself. There are things that even what we saw just now in the New Testament, Jude, even Jesus made reference to things that happened under the Old Testament. That's absolute truth. And we get even further insight, especially, you know, when we look at Noah, a preacher of righteousness, how Lot vexed his soul living under those conditions that were in Sodom and Gomorrah. That tells me he was not living in agreement with that. He was not participating with that. He was not condoning that. He was not joining in with that. He vexed his soul living in those under those conditions of people living totally contrary to the word of God and justifying it. And justifying it. And false teachers and false doctrines allow people to live contrary to the word of God and feel just. That's part of the deception. Another question, how, what can you do to refute the false teachers and their teachings? I believe we need to start calling them out. And I mean we need to call them out by name. Amen. When we know that they're teaching false doctrine, I don't care who, how popular they are because they usually look for fame. So they do have a degree of popularity because that's part of the false deception is to exalt the creature above the creator. And they usually have an abundance now because one of the things is their motivation is self-gain. How they going to profit all people? How they going to folks say uh, fill their pockets? Money, greed, covenants. A lot of that usually are signs. And so we have to watch out for that. But I think we come to a place in the body of Christ where it's okay to stand up and call out names when we're trying to warn the saints not to let those individuals bring any influence in their lives when we know that doctrine is contrary to the doctrines of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we got to speak, continue to teach the truth. We got to continue to address issues that need to be addressed in our society with truth. We got to still have conversations in church on what they call sensitive subjects. It's not sensitive to God. It's just absolute truth. And, I, and you notice, if we just teach the word, uh, even when I was reading just now from these scriptures in Romans and uh, chapter 1, verse 24 through 27, and it was confirming Jude 1, 7, and, and Genesis 13, 13, all of that was building upon itself and basically dealing with the same uh, thing that was going on. And so I want to encourage you. This is good news for us now. Hallelujah. Can you imagine these People who are walking in the truth, not being able to understand what's going on with all of this false teaching, not knowing what to look out for. <laughs> Part of pastoring is to warn the sheep. Yes, feed them the word of God. That's what we're called to do. Feed God's people with knowledge and understanding. That's part of, that's the, to me, that's the priority of pastoring. God said, I will give you pastors after my own heart. He will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Some people look for all kinds of other things from a pastor and don't look for that first. And make sure that they're rightly dividing the word of truth. Make sure that they're bringing truth before the body of Christ. 
Remember, the truth has already been given. We don't have to fabricate it. We don't have to look for it. We don't have to give them our truth. It's the truth that God has already given us in the word of God. Well, I'm excited what God is doing, that in the midst of these false teachers of Peter's day, of Old Testament time, even of our present time, God's got a plan that he's unfolded. God's got a purpose that he's fulfilling, and you and I get to be a part of God's plan. That's good news. Glory to God. God has graced us so that we can not only be born again, but he's given us gifts, anointings, abilities, so that we can serve him with gladness and cheerfulness of heart. The Bible tells us in, in, uh, in uh, the scriptures that Colossians 3.23, whatsoever you do in word and deed, do it as unto the Lord and not unto men, for you shall receive the reward of your inheritance. Isn't it the good news? The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, that we are not to become weary. We are not to get tired and laboring, for we know that our labor is not in vain. And I'm paraphrasing. We know that the work we're doing is not in vain, but it's for the glory of God. Well, I know you've been blessed by the word. Thank you for coming to the table of truth. Thank you for getting your Bible and letting the apostle Peter minister the word of God to us. Uh, for the glory of God, equipping us so that we can do the work of the ministry. God bless you and have a great day in Jesus' name.